Want to hand out better magic items? That and more, right now. I, like many of you, have played a lot of D&D. And one thing that always bothered me is how freaking disposable magic items seem to be. Your character's first plus one sword is probably pretty awesome, right up until you find a plus two sword or something better. In fact, most of the things you'll find will be better, which means that you typically chuck or sell what used to be your most prized possession with despairing regularity. Unless you don't play with encumbrance rules, in which case, feel free to embrace your inner dragon and start building your own horde. Today, we're going to talk about some ways to make magic items seem, I don't know, more magical. We'll talk about how one game from antiquity tackled this, take a stroll through how I work them into my own games, and wrap up with what it all means for you and your group. What are your best tips for magic items? We would love to read them down in the comments below. But first, we're going to talk about one of my favorite role-playing games that most folks haven't even heard of. Imagine generations without sunlight or open sky. Way back in the early 90s, a gaming company named Fossa made a game, one you might have heard of, called Battletech. But we're not going to talk about Battletech yet. Nor are we going to talk about Shadowrun. We need to go all the way out to Earthdawn. Earthdawn has a lot of stuff going for it, and I super encourage interested parties to go check it out. It's been through a bunch of versions since the early 90s when I played. 4th edition was released about five years ago and is still under development. Unless you're watching this from the distant future, in which case, hello from 2020, future people. It kind of sucks now, but I'm glad you made it. Earthdawn magic items are complicated, on purpose. The expectation is that a character might get one or two of these during a campaign, which are both powerful and unique. My magic shield will be different than your magic shield. In fact, they probably don't even have the same magical properties if they're created correctly. Basically, as a character learns and grows, that character's magic items grow with them, binding to them and potentially changing the way those characters interact with the world. Because the items grow, we as GMs don't have to worry about putting a never-ending treadmill of disposable items with ever-increasing bonuses in front of our players. As long as items are created carefully, our players are going to get something cool and unique that fits their characters. And because the items are unique and powerful, each character gets to feel special in their own fun ways. As an example of what we want, Aragorn was so moved by the reforging of Narsil that he renamed the weapon Anduril Flame of the West. Wouldn't it be cool if we could grant that same feeling to our players? It's simple, really. It works like this. Earthdawn does three things with their magic items, each of which is optional for us hoping to lift these ideas into our own games. First, when the item is new and mysterious, unlocking powers requires learning about it. Second, continued investment in the item unlocks more powers over time. And third, each item is unique and interesting in its own right, which I'm pretty sure I've said like a million times already. I use all three of these in my own games for every non-mundane magic item. Player characters unlock each power level by learning key knowledge about the item, like who made it or what was the last owner's significance in their time. This is a sweet way to give your world a little bit more life. The later power levels are unlocked by performing a deed, something that reflects the most significant actions of the most significant wielder or honors them in some way. At that point, the player can invest some experience points into the item to unlock wondrous powers. They like that part. Every magic item I give out is bespoke to the character that wears or wields it. Because the character can't unlock all the powers yet, I can delay figuring out what the full list of powers is until I better understand what the player wants. I can also adjust future abilities based on the needs of the group, which gives me some wiggle room in case there's a glaring issue. This can sometimes save on prep, and less prep is objectively a good thing. For the early power levels, it's generally better to help characters grow horizontally rather than vertically, and that probably bears some explanation. Vertical growth means characters get better at what they already do. Fighters are tougher, wizards are more exploding, and basketball players are more Mike-like. Horizontal growth widens the character's toolbox by giving them additional capabilities that they otherwise might not have, like being able to leap small buildings in a single bound. Examples of horizontal growth in 5th edition terms. Trade a small number of hit points to move up one or more slots in the turn order. Trade a spell slot for advantage on fear and charm saves for the next n rounds. For a small number of hit points, gain additional movement this round. You can probably come up with better examples if you play a lot of 5th edition. All of these are adding options to characters without necessarily making them directly more powerful. I generally save the vertical powers for when character progression slows down more than I'd like. Examples of vertical growth again in 5th edition terms. Trade a small number of hit points for additional damage for the next n turns. Trade disadvantage on initiative rolls for advantage on attack or damage rolls. As a bonus action, activate a mystical shield that offers n temporary hit points twice per day. Once you get to the higher power levels, let your imagination run wild, but be mindful of how this power might affect your game. 
it is super easy for the group to become so powerful that it is difficult to find credible threats to throw at them, especially if you don't tinker with your monsters. But tinkering with monsters is a different video. But what does it all mean? These mechanics incentivize players to hang on to and invest in their items. Mold these items as needed as you gain understanding of your player character's desires and as you develop the themes of your campaign. Make your magic items special enough to be memorable and weave them into the ongoing narrative. The items themselves can generate their own adventures. Players often want to figure out how to unlock the next wondrous power and will voraciously dig into whatever world building you put in front of them, and bonus points if it all feeds into your current campaign. That, friends, is a baited hook. The legend of each item builds with each event that transpires in play. Every journey that they undertake to understand their treasures and every travail they overcome to unlock their powers add to the item's mysticism. This is just one way where we can get a long-term personal investment of the player into the character. It's the kind of thing that builds epic stories over time, and the kind of tales that we tell well after the events have unfolded. Players from my previous campaigns over the last four years love to regale newer players in my current campaigns about all the fun and interesting things they'd found. That's the kind of thing that we play for, the shared memory of the collaborative fiction we build at the table, and a thing that's hard to do in any other kind of medium. I hope that something in here can help your magic items become a little bit more magical. And if you want tips and tricks like these, start now by subscribing and hitting the bell so you know when I upload stuff. Thanks for staying classy, and I'll see you on Sunday. <laughs>